So welcome, Ginger. Um, hope life is treating you well. Thanks, Andrew. It is. We're very fortunate. It's beautiful in Colorado this time of year, and we're glad to be here. Oh, I wish I was there with you. <laughs> hey, um, so obviously your business, business accomplishments are, are numerous, but I think we'd like to start just getting a little bit of background. So can you tell us how you grew up, uh, where you grew up, and uh, any, any key moments? Well, I feel like a very uh, much a storybook. I grew up on a farm in rural Arkansas, much like McDonald's farm. We had a little bit of everything. My parents raised beef cattle and quarter horses, but also poultry. I had a pet lamb. We had yard chickens, you know, all of those things that you hear stories about. But it was very much a simple time, I think. My dad was a mailman and he would get up really, really early in the morning and take off to work. And then when he got home, he was a farmer. And my mom kept books for Ford Motor Company and babysat children and was also manual labor on the farm. So we grew up growing our food, uh, butchering food, but they were part of the community, part of a church, part of a town for 60 years. And we grew up on a dirt road where you grew lots of your own food and made your own clothes and uh, just lived with your community and took care of each other out in the country. Oh, there's a lot there from, from what I know of your career that has sort of come from all the way back then, you know, that, that sense of humbleness uh, and, uh, and, and grounding. But there's a couple other things I know that you, that you didn't touch on. You're an accomplished writer. Uh, and I noticed, you know, in our conversation the day, we spoke about barrel writing. You have to tell that story. Come on. <laughs> Well, yes, it was very normal, but I grew up on a horse. Uh, my parents had cattle and horses and it was a working farm. And so we actually used the horses to move cattle around. But back where we lived, 4-H, play day, uh, local community activities around horses, rodeos. So I grew up learning to rope a calf. Uh, goat tying was a competition for girls. And I spent a lot of time on a horse and enjoyed every minute of it. In fact, I still have horses today and just had a ride this weekend. So it's never too late to love horses and to stay part of having horses in your life and in your activity. Jack and I love to ride. And so we even today take off with the trailer and the horses and ride in the mountains. Yeah, I mean, I, I noticed in my notes that you'd, you'd just you'd driven all the way across the country or halfway across the country to, to Santa Barbara recently with your horses. Yes, we took a camper and two horses and our new puppy and we took off across the country and camped and rode in beautiful places. It's a great form of therapy for me. It's a, a wonderful scene when you're in the great outdoors and Jack and I both love to go. And I remember though, again, we're, we're not really touching on the barrel racing a little bit because there was a, a story the other day um, when you and I were comparing the number of concussions that we've had. Uh, and it seemed quite frankly that you, you probably lapped me, you know, two or three times there. I mean, that, you've, you've grown up tough. Well, when you grow up on a farm, you do a lot of things. And uh, I did ride horses from the very beginning. I have old black and white film footage of me as almost a baby uh, leading a big horse around. So I've had several concussions. I've been thrown many times, uh, but I learned to compete and learn to take care of animals as part of your success, whether it was barrel racing or calf roping. I competed in lots of pageants that were rodeo based. So I was the Arkansas State High School Rodeo Queen, and then I was Miss Rodeo Arkansas. And it just gave me a great opportunity as a public speaker, an advocate for a sport and a way of life, uh, and the opportunity to travel my state and meet people and really brag about what an important community it is to be part of farming and agriculture, and by extension, rodeo and other sports with animals. That's, again, remarkable background there that I think you will see will reflect throughout the rest of the, the conversation. So then off, off to the University of Arkansas. For, um... Yes, not exactly straight. I wanted to be a vet. You can imagine a girl growing up on a farm. All I ever wanted to be was a veterinarian. And so I went out of state as Arkansas didn't have a vet school and went to a school in Texas. And it was a great idea because 
the state of Arkansas would reimburse you for your education if you came back and practiced medicine in the state of Arkansas. And we really didn't have the means for my brother and I to go to college. So it was a great plan. But like many plans, I did the pre-vet program and then I came back home and I worked for a veterinarian for a year and I learned that I really didn't want to be a veterinarian. And at that point, I had never had another thought about anything that I would be. So I transferred back to the University of Arkansas, which was very close to where I grew up. It was an in-state school, so it saved a lot of money. I lived at home, I got three part-time jobs and tried to figure out what's next. And luckily, like many things in life, I found a great mentor, a professor who was my advisor, and he encouraged me to take an economics class. And that was it from then on, uh, the whole world of business and economics, a whole new way of thinking, something I'd never been exposed to, but I loved it. And I graduated with an ag economics degree. And then what was the impetus to go to, to Harvard? Oh, it's like so many things in life, you know, it wasn't a plan. I, I'd never met anyone from Harvard. I didn't even know where Harvard Business School was, which seems crazy, but I was working uh, first as a sales rep and then in marketing and agriculture. I went to work for the world's largest agriculture chemical company out of the University of Arkansas. Thanks to, again, a mentor, the uh, dean of the college helped set up an interview with several companies and I fell in love with the Lanco. And so I worked in soybeans and cotton fields and learned row crop agriculture, which I had not grown up with, had a great experience. But at the time, Jimmy Carter was president and he embargoed, embargoed Russia. And when Carter embargoed Russia, it collapsed the US agriculture market. The company I was working for downsized by half and I was still there, but there weren't really the opportunities to grow and make a difference in the same way. So I started researching business schools and you know, I went to a library, what an old idea, and looked at brochures about business schools in the US because an advisor at Elanco had said to me, you love to learn, you don't know business, and you would really benefit from more education. And so I loved the brochure about Harvard where you learn in the Socratic method. I love to debate and talk and hear from other people. That's how I learn best. So I applied to Harvard. It was crazy. I only applied to Harvard. I thought, well, if I can't get in Harvard, then I'll stay home and go to school part-time and learn some things on the side. And now it seems preposterous, but uh, they let me in. <laughs> I, th I think it's remarkable just uh... Yeah, just a small little school, Harvard Business School. Uh, and then something you just said that I think is so uh, so telling, uh, which is that not wasn't necessarily a plan. Now, I think we'll dig into it a little bit later. So by that, I think there was probably no direct line of sight and you had to accomplish this than this. I think there's probably an overall plan and that's part of your drive and your ambition. But it is something that we notice when we're mentoring younger folks these days is that everything seems very programmatic. You do this then followed by this. And I, I love to see someone as tremendously successful as you are, send the message that, hey, it doesn't have to be scripted. You can find your way now yeah. getting into Harvard Business School. Yeah. Well, you know, Andrew, I, I actually tell young people all the time that of course they don't know what they wanna do. Of course they don't. How could you, you've never done it. And even though it sounds perfect for me, growing up on a farm, being a horse addict, uh, loving animals, you know, not being afraid of the dirt and the manure and then the night time and all of those things, of course I was going to be a vet. But in reality, the job, the job itself, many times is directed toward caring for animals in ways that were not consistent with how I was raised and more animals as pets as opposed to animals uh, with a role in life. And I found that those choices were very difficult for me. And so I knew I wouldn't be a good vet. And then what, then what on earth? And I think so many young people have an idea in their head about what they're supposed to be, what their parents wish they would be, what their older brother or sister has already accomplished. And there's so much external pressure on who, what, how, how you look, how you go about it, how fast you get through school. And I don't believe that any of us are wired to know 
we're wired to learn and experience and to benefit from experiences and apply those. And my advice to young people always is make the best decision you can make right now. It's only one. You're yeah. going to make 40 or 50 more, especially in today's world. My dad worked for the U.S. Post Office and the U.S. military for 40 something years. People don't do that anymore. And people are going to make a lot of choices and accept a lot of change. So embrace this one, learn from it, get the most out of it, give your all, and then dust yourself off. And when another door opens, walk through it. And yeah. I think that's a journey. It's not like there's one place you're going to go and be stuck your whole life. Yeah, I think that's incredibly valuable advice. So following Harvard, what was next? Well, one of the great things about going to Harvard Business School, uh, many things. One was being exposed to people who had done things I'd never heard of. You know, you can imagine, I didn't know where it was. I'd never been to Boston. Uh, my mom got in a car with me and we drove and almost like to never found Harvard Business School because of the complexity of the highways and got there and realized that so many of the students had life experiences I had never even heard of. So that was a real learning experience first, just to know all the things in the world that are possible, but also to realize over time that I could compete with people who had had vastly different life experiences and backgrounds than mine. And that was very helpful in terms of building confidence and of course, building skills and knowledge at Harvard Business School. And one of the things that happened is I made good friends with a couple of other women in my section. And one of them had worked on Wall Street and I didn't even know what Wall Street was, but she convinced me that I should apply. So I interviewed with Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and uh, it was actually quite an interesting process because I'd never had a finance course or an accounting course. I was green as you can be coming into Harvard Business School. And I persuaded Morgan Stanley to hire me, which was very fun. I actually still have a little recording back from uh, you know, a voice machine that says, I can't believe we're doing this, but we want you to come join us uh, at Morgan Stanley. And it was a great, it sounds like a downer, but it was an unbelievable affirmation that I had persuaded them personally that I was the right kind of person to hire, even though I had no relevant background. So I worked on Wall Street, which uh, caused an incredible, you know, eye-opening experience culturally, in the transaction world, in a lot of things that I'd never been exposed to. And coming out of business school, I still wanted to work in a company that provided products for people, not just transactions and services. But I had the good fortune to work for Eli Lilly and Company as a manager in finance coming out of Harvard Business School, which also still makes me smile because I still really didn't have any financial background. But going to Lilly opened up so many opportunities. They were a, a company that had a vast array of businesses at the time, and they owned Elizabeth Arden. So after business school, I started in finance at Lilly, and they decided they wanted to sell Elizabeth Arden. And so I was able to run the entire global team that put Arden on the block in an auction and worked again then with Morgan Stanley, who was the hired banker, and moved back to New York to work at Elizabeth Arden and to go through a very extensive auction process to sell the company. Again, a tremendous responsibility at a, at a young age. You've worked your way into that, yeah. It was way beyond my capability. And it's one of the things that I still today appreciate so much is I had opportunities that were far beyond my knowledge set, but people had confidence in my decision-making and my thought process and my ability to lead through a decision with a group of experts to get something done. Elizabeth Arden was fascinating. It was integrated into every country around the world at Lilly, so we had to extract it. And that was a great accounting lesson because I worked with a very senior person at Lilly who knew everything about the chart of accounts and every decision made inside each country who could help extract Arden from Lilly to sell it. I went to the manufacturing facilities and really understood the capability and what assets were for sale. They also owned Main Chance, which was a salon or a spa that Elizabeth Arden herself had put together 
and it had amazing art. So I was able to hire Sotheby's and do art appraisal and understand how to dispose and first renovate Renoir's and uh, there was a Georgia O'Keeffe that was a fabulous giant famous painting, the Jimson Weed, one of her most famous. And so I had all these experiences associated with a giant transaction, the largest ever in the cosmetics industry. And it just so happened that the market crashed at the time that we were supposed to close the deal. It was Black Tuesday in 1987, and we lost the deal and had to reframe it. And I made so many mistakes. It's a wonder I didn't get fired. But one of the executives, the CEO that Lily had put in charge of this Arden sale, he said to me, he said, I just spent a lot of money on you and your mistakes. Why would I fire you? And he really said it more nicer than that. He said, we just invested a lot of money in you and all of this learning and the mistakes you made. Why would we fire you? And it was a great lesson to me in leadership and in picking talent and then letting them learn and make mistakes, but hopefully supporting them and bounding them so that you can recover from them. Yeah, so many things to pull out of that conversation. One, you seem to thrive on the challenge, right? A lot of people may have been crushed by that of, well, I've never done this before. You know, the imposter syndrome doesn't seem like that's even in your, in your thinking at all. It is so interesting. I, I do my best learning. I think that's something I have come to know about myself very clearly is that in that moment when I'm on the steepest learning curve, I'm at my best, that opportunity to learn, to ask a million questions, to meet everyone who knows more than me and to just try to bring all of that energy and intellect and knowledge and experience and judgment into a place to do what we've been asked to do. When I went to work for Morgan Stanley, you know, I lived in New York City. Uh, I had to learn how to navigate. I was scared to death to live in New York City in the 80s as a single female. And people taught me life coping skills. And I had to work for Conrail. They were held by the US government at the time. And the government wanted to send them back out as a public entity. They had been in receivership essentially and Norfolk Southern wanted to buy them. And so Goldman Sachs was hired to help Norfolk Southern buy Conrail and Morgan Stanley was hired by the US government to take Conrail public. And so I ended up building a computer model first time I'd ever had a computer about a 20 year forecast of rolling stock and the tax impact to the US taxpayer if Norfolk Southern bought Conrail because they'd get to use all their tax loss carry forwards. And I had never heard of any of those concepts before that job. So uh, Arden was the same, you know, traveling with uh, Arden sales reps, working behind Arden counters, understanding how the business works and where the value lies and how to make it a better business and then selling Arden, which was amazing in terms of the technical aspects of the deal. I think over and over, I love new opportunities to learn and new opportunities to bring people together who know way more than I do to try to get something done that everyone says is impossible or maybe too hard. A remarkable degree of self-confidence. And, and again, do you think growing up that self-confidence and awareness, right? Um, so the sporting activity, the horse riding, the, the, you know, how you grew up on, on the farm, do you think that led to this or this well, is just you? Yeah, my parents definitely had a giant impact on all of us kids. The, the way they framed our world was very simple. There was no expectation about what we would do or what we would be and accept to be a good person. So to put yourself into it fully, do your best work and, and be a good person while you're doing it. And they had infinite confidence in us. I, you know, my brother knew from when he was young, he wanted to be a pharmacist and sure enough, uh, he was a pharmacist and then he ran, uh, ran the largest Walmart pharmacy and then he opened his own business 
and had the sixth fastest growing medicine shop in the US. And then he uh, got a PharmD and then he became a professor of pharmacy and then he opened a pharmacy school. And you know, I think his path is also one where our parents said, uh, you can do anything. And for a female, I think that's especially helpful that your parents believe you can do anything and there were no limits. Uh, my mom was convinced I was gonna be the first woman secretary of agriculture because I was such an ag kid and loved it. And I love my ag degree and my experiences. And uh, you know, my dad had a very powerful personality. He was a leader, he was a leader in the community. Uh, he was in the JCs when the local rodeo came to town and guys dressed up in beards and cowboy hats and rode horses down the street. My dad was at the front. Uh, he was a part of the NALC, the National Association of Letter Carriers, and went to Washington, D.C. He met the president. And my dad's uh, saying was always the same. He said, because I thought he would be nervous meeting the president. And for him, he said, I put my pants on one leg at a time, just like he does. So there was always this yeah. sense for my parents that you are capable, you know, you've been given a gift in life. It's uniquely yours. Uh, use it to your maximum ability. You have a responsibility to be your best self and be a good person. And that's really all there ever was. And they were convinced we could do anything we want. And of course they sacrificed enormously to try to send us to school. So we would have education they didn't have a chance to have, and we would have opportunity that they never had because neither one of them were able to get a college education. So I can tell you this, I know we're gonna have one viewer of, of this and that's gonna be <laughs> my 13 year old daughter. She's, yeah. <laughs> she's gonna watch that last, she's gonna watch the whole thing, but for, I am gonna highlight that last minute, two minutes there. Uh, and I think, I think you paid your parents support back. I think you paid them back well. So well, that's very nice of you. I don't know if I ever can. That'll make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> well, what would probably make you cry if you were Secretary of Agriculture? <laughs> <laughs> Although, you know, I've thought about it. Like, the, the ag policy is so screwed up. And there are so many, um, you know, so many ways that I just think we should be a self-sufficient economy in so many aspects. And we should make choices as an economy to think about you know, how we want to handle our ag land, like where we live right here in Colorado, they're doing something called buy and dry, which uh, towns are buying up farmland remotely because they get the water rights and yeah. they're drying up that farm and they're taking the water off of it. And, you know, that's, that's suicide for a country. So there are still times when I think it might be worth doing. <laughs> yeah. I know it's not, a, it's an appointed job, but if I had a, had a, had a chance to vote for you, I would. <laughs> All right, so, um, yeah, remarkable so far. I mean, as I said, I think you and I could talk for days because there's so many things to pull out. But let's let's touch on uh, ACS and guidance. So, wow. Eli Lilly, you now get an opportunity to go and run ACS, so Advanced Cardiovascular Systems, uh, an iconic and a very important uh, business within our industry and in the evolution of our industry. Um, you know, the family tree from that company threads through the majority of other startups out here in Silicon Valley. So can you describe a little bit of your ACS experience? How'd you get it? What was the opportunity? Well, certainly the offer to be the CEO of ACS was a lifetime game changer. There's no doubt about it. And it was a total shock as well. I was literally on a payphone in an airport in Dallas, Texas, when I was offered the job to be the CEO of ACS. And I had no idea it was coming. I actually thought they were likely to give me the head of sales and marketing for ACS. So the structure was um, you know, pretty simple. Lilly, a big company owned 10 medical device and diagnostics companies. And Lilly used their geographic affiliates, Canada, all the countries in Europe and around the world, and their smaller companies as training grounds for future leadership for Eli Lilly and company. And so it was not uncommon for people who had done well inside of Lilly. And I had been their first director of sales as a female in Lilly's history. 
and had uh, luckily been number one in the nation, which I think had a lot more to do with my district managers and the gentleman who came before me than my experience. But it was a great, great opportunity to learn a lot about the customer and the business. And so I knew Lily would be putting me in other opportunities. And I had heard rumors that it would be going out to one of the device companies. But uh, no one was more surprised than me when I got offered the CEO job. And then, so then up and moved, you up and moved all the way across the country. Yes, I was living at the time in Dallas as a director of sales and the job was based in San Jose, California. So uh, I was set up pretty clearly before I got there. The gentleman who was the prior CEO had told the executive team, who of course, none of them have ever heard of me and would not have a reason to, he said to them, well, your new CEO is a Harvard MBA who also has been a bull rider. And both of those things are true, but of course they were not expecting exactly what they got. So uh, it was really you know, a once in a life experience and definitely at a time in ACS's history that was a challenging time. So ACS had had a lot of uh, issues. There was a large uh, departure of a significant amount of the research and development team there had been a number of product recalls the year before, literally more than the company had launched. And there were a number of challenges for the first time ACS was losing market share and there was a lot of unrest in the business. And just before I arrived, the FDA issued a second warning letter to the company. And so when I got to ACS, there was really a lot of dissatisfaction and unrest which ended up, I think, being the greatest gift I could have been given. Yeah. Because when things aren't going well, people are more likely to listen to new ways of thinking and accept change. And it just started an amazing 10 year ride in the medical device industry. How did you approach it in those early days? You know, you're, you're recognized as a very strong communicator. Was a lot of this about you know, setting the vision, resetting the vision and communicating it? How, how'd you go about doing it? Well, it's true that there's a, a, you have to start, you have to start somewhere. And obviously I was an unexpected individual as CEO. There was a good deal of skepticism, which was very legitimate. I had never seen an angioplasty. I didn't know how to spell angioplasty. Um, so as a coming in as someone to lead an organization that's in trouble, there was a good deal of skepticism about whether I was an appropriate choice or not. And quite a bit of resistance, as you might imagine. Yep. And I think all completely legitimate. So I spent my first three months literally listening, meeting with everyone, walking the halls, asking questions, riding with reps, talking to our customers, standing in cath labs, just spending all of my time investigating, learning, listening, trying to understand what was going on and why. So after a first three months on the job at the end of 92, we rolled into the national sales meeting in January of 1993 with a sales force that was very activated, very anxious, very unhappy with the state of the company. And I just told them the truth. I told them what I had learned. And although ACS had been the first company in the medical device industry to hit $100 million, they had been the first company in the industry to have $100 million of revenue overseas. They had been leaders in so many different technologies, whether it was you know, the pressure devices or uh, the guide wires or uh, the angioplasty balloons themselves, everything ACS had done had been first and amazing, but they were behind. And I knew that and everyone in the company knew that, but no one wanted to say it out loud. So I just said, you know, what I heard when I took the job was about this amazing, leading, fast moving, innovative culture, responsive to customers, incredibly focused on patients and patient health. And what I found instead was a lot of finger pointing and blaming and uh, you know, really negative behavior and people leaving and everyone thought it was someone else's fault. And so we started there and said, 
We can't fix it unless we say it out loud, give it a name, say the truth, and then let's solve the problem. And so then we did a lot of dramatic things to solve the problems. So before we get into some of those dramatic things, because I would like to explore that, I think it's really important that despite being in a, an incredibly tense environment, you know, where, where people are going to be looking for action as soon as you come on, you took time, you took three months to actually learn and understand the problem. And I think that again is very, very instructional for anybody listening here. Join us for part two, when we talk with Ginger about the vital steps she took to turn ACS around, her time building a culture at Guidance and much more, including a wealth of advice you really don't want to miss.